Aloete Omnes. Today we are going to be talking about verbs. So what are we going to be covering in this lesson? Well in this lesson we're going to be covering what is a verb, what does person mean, what does number mean, what does tense mean, what does voice mean and what does mood mean. Those are the five aspects that make up a verb. Um, and then also how to translate and parse a verb. However, what we are not covering in this lesson are the different verbal conjugations. So you may or may not know that Latin has five different verbal conjugations. And so first conjugation, second conjugation, etc., etc. And this just tells you how the verb conjugates, right? So it's how it forms its ending. So it has more to do with the tables and some is more something that you're just gonna have to memorize. And then the other things that we will not be covering in this lesson are infinitives, participles, gerunds, gerundives, and any other verbal shenanigans, because there are a lot of things to do with verbs. This is just what is a verb and what makes up a verb in Latin. So what is a verb? So a verb is a doing word. That is, it is a word that identifies what action is happening in a given sentence. For example, in the sentence Lucretia sees Marius in the distance, the verb is to see because that's the action that's happening in the sentence. So, like I alluded to before, a verb in Latin will always be made up of five different components. It's person, number, tense, voice and mood. And when your teacher asks you to parse a Latin verb, right, or when you want to translate a Latin verb, you're going to have to know how these different aspects correspond to an English translation. So let's start with person. That is the first thing that you'll probably learn when you are in Latin class. So person refers to the subject who is doing the action. And there are three options, right? There's a verb will always either be first person, second person, or third person. So first person means that the speaker is doing the action. I see a cupcake. Second person means the addressee, the addressee, or audience is doing the action. So you see a cupcake. And third person means somebody else is entirely is doing the action. So he sees a cupcake. Quinter sees a cupcake, etc., etc. So third person is doing a lot of the work here, and third person is what you almost often see in the wild. Uh, verbs will usually be third person. So these are just some examples. So first person would be I like to eat ice cream. I enjoy fishing we were dancing all night and the second person would be you like to eat ice cream you enjoy fishing you were dancing all night and then third person could be something like he likes to eat ice cream or it could be she enjoys fishing or they were dancing all night there's a lot of options with third person but first and second person will always be i we or you okay so now we have defined person, we go on to define number, which is probably the easier of the two. So when talking about verbs, number refers to whether the subject is singular, one person doing the action, or plural, two or more people doing the action. So in English, the first person singular is I, and the first person plural is we because it's still the speaker doing the action, it's just multiple speakers doing the action. Um, English is a little bit tricky <laughs> because uh, the second person singular and the second person plural are both you. So you can't get that wrong there. And then the third person we have in the singular, it could be he, she, it, those are the pronouns. Um, but it could also be a name, it could be a place, it could be a thing. Um, and then in the third person plural, 
again in English it's they, um, but it could also be like the cats jumped over, right? If you want to be a bit, you know, they jumped over, the cats jumped over is just a bit more specific. Okay, so we've done person, we've done number. Let's get on to some of the slightly more complicated aspects of what makes up a verb. So, tense. <laughs> tense refers to the temporal aspect in which the action is taking place. So person and number, you can think of them as telling you who is doing the action, right? Tense is telling you when they did the action. So in Latin, there are six, <laughs> six tenses. So we've got the present tense, which, no shocker, is happening in the present. Uh, so I am holding a spear. Then we've got the imperfect tense, which we will go into some of these trickier tenses that don't come up so often um, a little bit later. But an example of the imperfect tense would be, I was holding a spear. Then we've got the perfect tense, which is just the fancy Latin, Latinist way of saying the past tense, right? So I held a sphere, it's happening in the past. Then we've got the future tense, happening in the future. I will hold a sphere. And then we've got the pluperfect tense, which lump that in with the imperfect tense as being one that doesn't come up so often and is not as easy to get as the present past and future. Um, I had been holding a sphere is an example of the pluperfect tense. And then finally, <laughs> the crowning glory of weird tenses is the future perfect tense. I will have held a sphere. Uh, so let's look at these a little bit closer, right? So present and perfect, pretty clear. So the present denotes an action that is happening in the present moment or in a story that's happening at the moment of narration. The perfect tense, which is on the right hand side, denotes an action that happened in the past and has been completed, right? I danced. That uh, indicates that you finished, finished dancing. Whereas the imperfect tense denotes a continuous action that happened in the past and is continuing into the present, right? So we've got this continuity that's happening. I was dancing. So let's just do a little bit more with the difference between the imperfect tense and the uh, perfect tense. So the imperfect tense is Aurelia was practicing the lyre when Lucretia and Claudia arrived, right? So in this one, we've got, uh, in this example, we've got the imperfect denoting something that happened in the past, but wasn't necessarily completed, right? So in that sense, it's continuous in the sense that it was not finished, right? She was doing this when something else happened that stopped her from doing, stopped her from completing the action. Then we've got the perfect tense, right? Versus the perfect tense. Aurelia practiced the liar, then reclined on the couch, right? You cannot see her reclining on the couch because of me, but there she is, she's reclining on the couch. Um, so here we've got some, we've got a completed action, right? She finished practicing the liar then did another action. So that's one way of differentiating in your mind the difference between the imperfect and the perfect tenses. Okay, now we've got the future tense, which denotes an action that is happening, that will happen in the future. I don't know if that sentence makes sense. Uh, it's just, it's gonna happen in the future. <laughs> okay. Then we've got the pluperfect tense. So the pluperfect tense denotes an action that took place before another action that took place in the past. This is where we get into some verbal shenanigans. Latin likes the idea of sentences being sort of a babushka doll 
of um, verbs, right? So they're all <laughs> sort of the pushkudo you just keep keep opening up. There'll be like six verbs in one Latin sentence, and they all sort of correspond. So the pluperfect tense is a tense that only makes sense when it's relative to another verb or another action that's happening, right? So it's saying that action A happened and action B happened before action A. That makes any sense. Okay, and then the future perfect tense denotes an action that will happen after another action that will take place in the future. <laughs> So we've got a similar idea. So we've got action A hasn't happened yet, uh, but will happen. And then action B will happen, but it can only happen after action A has taken place. So <laughs> let's actually look at some examples and it might make a little bit more sense. So an example of the blue perfect tense for me, when she saw Metella at the forum. Okay, so here we have got two actions, right? We have got action A, which we're going to call action A because that's the main verb of the sentence, right? This would be called the, the main clause. And we've got action B. So action A is in the past, so it's in the perfect tense, right? And we need something to denote that action B happened in the past, but it also not only happened in the past, but it happened before action A happened, right? Which is how you get the pluperfect which I'm not going to attempt to write out in full. <laughs> okay, now we've got an example of the future perfect tense. Fetus will have delivered the scroll to Glauconomy before she sees Metella at noon. So again, we've got two verbs. We've got verb A. And we've got verb B. So verb A is happening in the future. Oops. In the future. Right? She will see. Um, she hasn't seen Glauconomy. No, sorry. She hasn't seen Metella yet. <laughs> she hasn't seen Metella yet. Um, okay. Whereas action B which is the delivery of the scroll is going to happen in the future, but it's happening in the future before action A actually happens. So that's how the future perfect works. Okay. So those are the six tenses. Uh, now we can move on to the two final aspects of the verb, which are probably the two final things that you'll be introduced to, um, you know, like in the later section of learning Latin. And so that's voice and mood. So there are two different voices when discussing Latin verbs. There's the active voice, and then there's the passive voice. So the active voice is telling you when the subject of the sentence is doing the action of the verb, right? So um, hint, hint, most things will happen in the active voice. And then we've got the passive voice, which is when the action of the verb is being done to the subject, right? Marius was taken to Athens by boat. So in this example of the sentence, Marius isn't doing the action. Even though he's the subject of the sentence, the action is being done to him. So we can compare. I can't see this glorious, glorious Cyclops. Okay, so compare these two sentences. Odysseus killed the Cyclops with Odysseus was killed by the Cyclops. And you can see the immediate difference that the active and the passive <laughs> voice makes, right? 
So if you are doing the action, if you are doing the killing, that's one thing. But if the action of killing is being done to you, that is an entirely different thing. So that's the example that I usually use to sort of contrast the active and passive voices. Okay, now the final one that we get to is mood. So mood, when referring to verbs, identifies modality, which is very fancy and doesn't mean much to anybody. So in what mode or realm the action exists in, right? This is why mood is usually left until last because, you know, like temporal, you know, aspect, it's like, okay, what time, at what time the action was, you know, and person and number, it's like, okay, who, who's doing it? Um, this is sort of, what realm does the action exist in? So yes, while something like tense identifies the verb's temporal mode, or temporal realm, um, mood identifies the verb's substantiality, let's say. So there are three verbal moods in Latin, which all express different aspects of substantiality, how substantial the action is, if that makes any sense at all. So we've got the indicative, the heavy lifter. Most verbs are in the indicative, especially in English. Um, not so much in Latin because they love the subjunctive because they love to make things complicated for us. But, you know, with most Latin readers and stuff like that, um, readers as in like a book of Latin paragraphs for you to translate, most of it will be in the indicative until you get to like the harder, later sections, right? So we <laughs> usually start you out in the indicative, um, which expresses factual reality, which is where most English mood is, the most common English mood. Okay, then we've got the imperative, which expresses a command which is obviously where we get the word imperative in English from, right? It's, it is imperative that you do something right now, right? It is commanding you to do something. And then finally, we've got the polytropos, the wily and twisted subjunctive, which expresses a hypothetical reality, which is why we say that mood revert refers to the how substantial an action is right the indicative it's like actually going to happen or actually has happened the subjunctive is like hypothetically this could happen right so let's have a little look so the indicative the chat is used to communicate a statement of fact or to ask a question right quintilla ate a piece of bread Quintus saw Quintilla and asked, would you like some milk with that? All of the verbs there are in the indicative mood. Then we've got the imperative. She can't see that. Is used to communicate a command, right? Which is what we just talked about. So drop that sword or else, right? Or um, this is a little fun, fun tidbit, is that the Latin way of saying hello, salve, is actually an imperative. Um, so you're literally commanding someone to be in good health. Be in good health. That's how you say hello. Um, so with the imperative, I just like to think of a mum and a child, right? The, a mum and a child is going to be using a lot of imperatives, uh, you know, clean your room, you know, don't eat <laughs> that piece of garbage off the floor, you know, so that sort of thing, right? It's, com it's a command. So you can see how this is separate from the indicative because it's not actually happened, right? It's not a fact but it's someone telling someone else to do something. And then finally, we get to the subjunctive, which is, this is not an exhaustive list. I have a disclaimer. This is not an exhaustive list. <laughs> Let's just say that 
there are three main uses of the subjunctive in Latin. The first one is to express a conditional. So, if I was rich, I would buy an enormous villa, right? So, in here we've got two verbs, was, which is uh, in the indicative mood, right? But because it's, you know, an if statement, then the next bit goes into the subjunctive, I would buy, right? They're not going to buy, it's not in the indicative, it's not something that is going to happen, but it is something that could happen if they did become rich, um, right? So, you know, another fun one, if I am to die, avenge me. Um, avenge then would be, oh, now that I think about it, it could be in the imperative, but it could also go into the subjunctive as the second part of a conditional statement. The second one, the second use of the subjunctive is to express fear. So, for example, I fear lest Claudia comes to my party. Um, there's a very popular way of translating this in Latin <laughs> using lest. Um, in modern English, we would probably say, I fear that Claudia is going to come to my party. Um, but that's, I don't know, got stuck in the 19th century and a lot of textbooks still tell you to translate it as lest. Um, and then that's good because your teacher can know, oh, okay, they know that it's a, a clause of fearing. They know that it's expressing fear. Um, okay, so, but this one, again, it's hypothetical, right? So the fear is in the indicative because the fear is real. You're experiencing the fear. Um, but what you're fearing is hypothetical, right? It's not actually come to pass yet and might not come to pass. Uh, another one of this is the fearing in the negative, right? I fear that Claudia won't come to my party, right? So again, fear is happening, but will she or won't she come uh, is hypothetical. So that's why it goes into the subjunctive. And then finally, again, not an exhaustive list, <laughs> but the final main use of the subjunctive in Latin is to express wishing or desire, right? So I desire to become rich, right? So the desiring is in the present because it's something that's happening, but the verb of what you want to occur is very similar to the fearing, right? Your wishing is happening, but whether what you wish is going to come into reality or not is still hypothetical right so i wish you would go to hell um so again the wishing is very much happening but you know will the person actually go to hell you know that's more hypothetical so hopefully this sort of highlights the uh use of the subjunctive to represent hypothetical reality right if x were to happen maybe Y would happen too. I am afraid if this thing in the future should come to pass. I desire that this thing in the future should come to pass. So there's lots of different ways that the subjunctive is used in Latin, but as a basic mood, it expresses a hypothetical uh, reality versus the indicative, which is uh, expressing a very real reality, true reality. Okay, so we've gone through all of this, <laughs> all the five aspects. It's been a bit of a mission, but we finally got to, so how do I parse a verb? If you're in Latin class, then your teacher is at one point going to ask you to parse a verb. Um, so the first thing is that you need to memorize your tables. <laughs> Uh, you don't need me to tell you that, but um, there are lots and lots and lots of tables uh, because basically each of these different aspects is presented by a certain ending, right? So we've got MO, which means I love, and then that's going to be different from Amas, which means you love. So each 
person number tense voice and mood is going to affect how the verb in Latin is formed, right? And so there's lots of big tables that tell you that you have to memorize that tell you all these features. So once you've, once you've hypothetically memorized all of these gigantuan tables, we can start by identifying the person, the number and the tense of the verb, right? That's always a good place to start. Who's doing the action? How many people are doing the action? What temporal aspect is the action? Then you need to identify whether the verb is active or passive, and then the mood, right? So an example of this, um, like something that you would write in a test, is <laughs> in a test it would have amatis, and then you would write down that that is second person, it is plural, it is present, it is active, and it's in the indicative. And then, you know, maybe you might, depending on the test, you might need to provide a translation, and you would then say, you are loving. And if you want to get extra brownie points, you put you plural in brackets, because in English, like we talked about earlier, there's no way to distinguish between you singular and you plural. Okay. Then another example would be amateur, which is third person, singular, future, passive, and imperative, which is a lot of information, which is why you need to learn your tables. Um, so how do you turn that into a translation, right? So you're going, okay, well, it's, let's start with the fact that it's imperative. So we know that it's a command. Right, so I'm probably going to put an exclamation mark at the end of our little translation to mark that we know that it's a uh, command. Then we know that it's passive. So we're not saying love someone, we're saying be loved by someone else, right? Uh, and then we know that it's going to be in the future, right? Which means that it's not be loved, it's become loved um, and then I've put in brackets become lovable um, you know obviously when you're doing real real Latin translation um, you're going to get these verbs in context right so in the context of a conversation you know if a mom is talking to her son about how he doesn't go out and how he doesn't shower enough and put on nice clothes and that's why he's alone and single and she doesn't have any grandchildren and you got amateur, you might translate this as like become lovable. Um, but that's sort of beyond the point in terms of a parsing exercise. You're just going to get given one verb. You need to talk about, you need to identify five aspects. So make sure that in your test, you've written down five things. <laughs> five things and then you can slowly begin to create a translation of that verb. Okay, ita perfecimus sic bene valeto. So that's it. <laughs> that's everything that we had to discuss today. So um, goodbye, good luck on your Latin journey uh, and hopefully I will see you again soon. Wale! Voilà.